Welcome to Interviews to Sue with your host, Dennis Sue. Today's guest, Carrollton businessman and candidate for District 30, Mike Dugan. Today we, may, we welcome Mike Dugan, who is running for the uh, District 30 Georgia Senate seat. Mike is a businessman with uh, Ray Lynn and Associates, a commercial contractor in uh, Carrollton. He retired in 2008 as a, with the rank of Lieutenant Colonel and wears both the Army Ranger and Airborne tabs. He served in Iraq and, and Afghanistan. First, I want to thank you for your service. Um, appreciate thank you. it very much, sir. I appreciate your service. And um, uh, let me ask you, what made you decide to get into politics? And that's, uh, and I understand why you use the term politics. Uh, what made me decide to get into it is because I've seen too much of politics. As, as you mentioned before, I'm retired in the military. Uh, I see it more as a public service, uh, and I think that we've kind of gotten away from that a little bit. That's my personal belief on it. And I, I think it's, um, I was sitting there wanting somebody to step forward to put the services piece back into it, and nobody did. So, you know, for for that simple reason, mm -hmm. I decided to, to throw my name in the hat mm -hmm. and serve as a representative. What, 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 what would be your key areas of interest of what are your key areas of well, interest? Well, the, the three things I would like to focus on um, during this, this first se session of mine would be uh, government ethics reform, business growth, and education. Uh, th those are the three that I, I can see the, the greatest immediate need for and where I can make the greatest impact over a short amount of time. Mm -hmm. You you mentioned the fact that you were interested in the ethics issues. Right. How do you? I know there there is a there is a uh, program where we're providing a a uh, hundred dollar uh, um, gap on on gifts and lob right. on lobbyists. Right. And I think a hundred is a is a generous cap. Um, during. I, I'm not one of those that's anti-lobbyist. I think lobbyists perform a, a, a valuable function. They you know, they provide you with a great amount of detailed information. Now, it's, it's biased information. It's from their point of view. But it's a great amount of detailed information that you can use, and hopefully what you're getting from the other side uh, of the issue is the same amount of information. Put those together and find the, the best, most comprehensive plan to help us. Now. That's reward enough for me. I don't think, in addition to that, I need to be compensated by the lobbyist firms or you know, go on excursions. I, I don't need that. The, uh, the fact that they're spending a lot of money to provide the information to help me do a better job as, a, as the senator for the 30th district, that's, that's all I need. So I, I'm a believer in, in capping it. Well, it's quite interesting you say that. I've heard exactly the same speech from the late Senator Richard Russell. Mm -hmm. he, we were sitting in his office one day talking to him, and he's talking about lobbyists. And he right. said, without lobbyists, we wouldn't know what in the hell is going on. Yeah. They come in here and pitch this side of the story, and right. the other guy comes in and pitches like right. you said. Then you got at least you got an understanding. Right. You know both groups are pitching their deals, right. but it's still the, 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 about the only avenue you have. Yeah. And, it, and it then becomes uh, based off our intelligence to, to discern what is the best, what is the truth, what is the, uh, how can we best use that information to best serve our constituents? Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, that that goes in with that ethics reform too. Um, that I am a everything is about the constituents. This is what I'm on right now. Not necessarily just this interview, but the whole campaign. Is the longest job interview that I've ever been on. It's uh, you know, from when I decided to run three, three and a half weeks ago to uh, November the sixth. It's a job interview where you go around to as many people, your potential bosses, as you possibly can, and convince them that you're the right guy to hire for the job. Uh, now you're hired for a fixed amount of time. The um, after that amount of time, then they can decide whether to send you back or. Uh, whether to put somebody else in that job. But that ties into um, another issue that, that I would like to put in there with the, as far as government reform is I'm a proponent of term limits. I think that, uh, hey, as we mentioned before, as I, I was talking before, uh, 
it's a public service. It's not a career. It's not a profession. It's a it's a service that you provide for a finite amount of time to help your community, your district, your state, your the national government, whatever level that you're at. And then after that time is up, you step aside and allow the next generation to come in. Now, the argument against that, obviously, is, well, the, um, the longer I'm here, the more I know the systems, the, uh, the, the, the more efficient I can be. I, I'm not buying it. I'm not buying it. The longer you're there, the more it's, well, this is how we've always done it. And that's not necessarily the best way to do it in the future. Uh, you are an advocate of education. Uh, would you like to elaborate advocate. on that? I, I, I would. My, both my parents are, were teachers. They're retired now. Uh, and from the earliest age, uh, they stressed to me the importance of education. Um, the, education, in my mind, drives everything. It drives job growth. It, um, it, the more educated you are, the more advantages you have, the less probable that you're going to be to be incarcerated. You know, it, it just, it's a key to so many different facets of our society that uh, we have to put an emphasis on it. Now, that's not necessarily, the emphasis is not necessarily pumping more money into it. The emphasis is figuring out how we can best serve the, the needs of the children coming through our school systems now. There's one common denominator, regardless of whether you're talking about um, career academies, traditional schools, home school, um, virtual school, and you know, there's, a, there's a, a plethora of different type of educational opportunities out there right now. But the one that ties everything together is, is the ability to read. The, tell me a job that you can think of where you don't have to read. But one of the things, and you know as well as I do, that we got about a 33% dropout rate in our in our schools right now um, a lot of the, the the findings that the initial findings were what we got to get the students more engaged it's true we do mm -hmm. but we're finding the ones that become disengaged are the ones that have fallen further and further behind in their reading capabilities and they're teenagers they uh, they have all kinds of other issues going on in their mind uh, one of them is uh, is they almost get embarrassed about their ability to, to read. So that the way they cope is to drop out of society. So let's do the reading. That, that's one. Then the second one is kids learn differently. Um, there are some kids that would be uh, content to sit and read Beowulf from cover to cover and, uh, and going through the, the traditional educational models that we've always had where we stressed You've got to graduate from high school and immediately go into a traditional college or university. Mm -hmm. If you want to be successful in life, you have to do those things. That's not necessarily the way I see it. Mm -hmm. Some kids learn more hands-on. Uh, uh, and when I talk about the career academies, that's that's one of the more hands-on. Are you familiar with career academies? Yes. Um, that is a more hands-on approach. Now, a lot of those kids will then leave the career academies and go, we have a whole nother college system outside the Board of Regents that's invaluable. To, to our state and invaluable to the 30th district, West Georgia Technical College. And it's not the old Votech school or, or, or what it was 30 years ago. That mindset has got to change. It is a technical college. It's putting out um, thousands of skilled laborers into our workforce that are immediately employable. Now, it, I don't know how familiar you are with the, with the uh, European models, but uh, in, in some of the European countries, they decide uh, a career track for a child when they're hitting our equivalent to high school. Some of them are the scholastic route. Some of them are the vocational route. I, I'm, I'm not advocating that. We're, you know, we're still a free society where you can, you can help make these decisions on your own, and you're responsible for making your decisions on your own. But um, uh, the kids and the parents kind of start going on and, and pick a path that is going to be most beneficial to them and you not only have a, an educated, engaged student, you've got a productive member of society as soon as they graduate, and we got alternatives, and we ought to look at all of them. Well, I think, the, to me, the vocational schools is uh -huh. something we really ought to look at. I mean, mm -hmm. it's so... Uh, I, I make an argument that everybody doesn't need a college education. Right. And look at the nooses that we have put around people's necks with these... Uh, uh, with these... Uh, uh, cost to go into higher education. Right, right. I think uh, 
I, have, uh, I think there, uh, the, we need plumbers, we need electricians. They're, they're, they make they make our society work. They do, they do, <laughs> and I, I know that I get excited about that. So, uh, you know, with your experience here, if I get going too fast, tell me to slow no, down no, because no. That, that is a uh, mm -hmm. like you alluded to when we started. Uh, I'm I'm very passionate about the mm -hmm. the education of the next generation of our society. Mm -hmm. Um, and part of selfish reasons, they, those are going to be the ones I'm leaving it to. I want to know it's in good hands. Well, we on a moving into uh, the, the, the uh, you know we incarcerate mm -hmm. uh, more people than any country in the world, mm -hmm. and obviously our that is not working. I mean, we're not solving the problem. How many you can only build so many jails and fill fill them up so with many people. Right. And uh, is there an answer to that? <sighs> No easy one, is there? No, no um, easy one. I mean, it, 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 I think we would both agree it doesn't work. Well, what I would, what I would agree oh, with you, you is I don't um, put words in your mouth. Uh, no, what, what I would agree with you is that uh, uh, we do incarcerate a lot of people. Uh, I don't know the numbers right off the top of my head, but I know a huge number is the recidivism. Uh, people have gone in for uh, for committing an initial crime. They come back into society after serving their time. Um, they have limited places where they can live. Um, they have limited places where they can work. They have, um, uh, you know, often they have a financial burden, especially if they have children uh, for child support that they get hit with immediately. Uh, There's some ways that we could look at that. How to how to reduce the recidivism and uh, and I, I know that the, the the sheriffs in all three counties in the district, Douglas, Carroll, and Paulding. Um, it's, it's a great concern of theirs, and they're actively trying to find ways to reduce it. And there's a lot of great non-governmental organizations out there that are working hard to, um, to address this issue. Uh, but if we can crack that code, if we can, I'm sorry, kind of went military on you there for no a second. Problem. If, if we can crack that code, uh, people are going to make mistakes. Some of them are going to go to jail for the mistakes that they make. But if we can crack the code of on how to make them productive, successful members of society after they've paid their initial debt, I think what you'll see is those numbers that, that we do hold in prison start coming down significantly. Many countries have, have legalized drugs, mm -hmm. and as a result, they've seen the actual drug rate go down. Mm -hmm. so. um, I, you would have to show me that one because, the, uh, you, you know, if, if you bring Amsterdam in as an example, uh, where they did a significant reduction in what they considered were illegal drugs, um, the, the drug rate actually climbed. Um, and and not only did the drug rate climb, but the uh, social service sector had to increase dramatically because um, uh, the medical issues that went along with it, the, um, the, the homeless issues. So you would have to, you'd have to show me the figures on that one. Well, it's quite interesting. I mean, we, we seem to... Uh, we worry about the user. We yeah. want to throw them in jail because they're uh, smoking mm -hmm. little grass or something. I'm and worried about the whole. Now, game. first of all, let me say I don't. I've never touched any of it. I, I don't even know what Good. it's about. Good. I was about. wondering where we were going. With no, this. I'm not going <laughs> in that direction. But I mean, um, I assume I, now I've consumed my fair Scott. <laughs> my, you know. <laughs> okay, I'm guilty there a little bit. Too. Uh, yeah. Uh, what kind of age I got away from that? Yeah. But uh, it seems like to me that we. We ignore. You know, we both know we can close the southern border. Mm -hmm. Yet we refuse to close it. Uh, that's a federal issue as it sits right now. I disagree with the uh, the position the federal government has taken on it. I think that uh, uh, if if we are, and it's not just a drug trade. Um, uh, you have the gang related violence crossing the border is. Uh, up in the 30th district, we haven't seen it as much, but if I lived in Brownsville or one of the border towns along Texas or, or even further west, the, uh, uh, it would be a significantly um, personal problem for me. Um, it, uh, and I'm trying to be careful on how I, I broach the subject, but uh, we have organizations that are bent on the destruction of our government, our way of life, that know that borders a, it's open. It's porous. Um, and so there's a variety of reasons that 
I would like us to have more control over the border, shut it down, let's sort stuff out, and then we can start opening passageways through. Now that's a that's also a huge, huge expense, um, and fortunately, um, it's it it's not something that uh, that we're facing immediately right here. Uh, we're facing facing the fallout from it, obviously. But uh, uh, you know, I I hope that, that our our federal government brethren address this thing here pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. We've had a number of citizens uh, that have lost homes here, repossessed right. homes. Right. Uh, I think our county is, right. seems to be pretty high in that right. arena. And uh, we have a, a, a non-judicial non uh, right. uh, repossession law uh -huh. in the books where a bank can just come and take your house without it, not any. But would you, there, there are uh, several of the candidates have said that we should go to a judicial Repossession. Yes, and if uh, and um, if that since we're only it's only a handful of states. I don't know the exact number, but it's right. a very small number of states that still do non-judicial foreclosure. Yeah, I and I've just I know that we've had a problem with the uh, foreclosures. Uh, uh, um, unfortunately, or fortunately, depends on how you look at it. Um, um, I'm not that knowledgeable about the foreclosure process. When I started, when I saw this non-judicial uh, method that we use here, uh, it inherently felt wrong to me. Uh, that doesn't seem, it doesn't seem, it almost makes it feel like a pawnbroker owns your house and can reclaim it at any time he wants to. Um, that's, that's not the way we should be set up. But I'm going to have to look into the, how we got to this point. What, Intuitively, it, it doesn't feel like we're, we're on the right course right now. I I would agree with you on that. Yeah. Uh, on the um, uh, on, on taxes, what do you uh, what how do you see the, the how do you see a role role in the tax area for for this county? I, 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 what, yeah. I, I, thank you for asking that. They, there are um, there are nine states right now that don't have a, a state income tax. Two of them are on our borders. Now, I know that they have advantages that we don't have. Tennessee being one of them gets a lot of money from the TVA. I mean, generations later, they're still getting a lot of money from the TVA, which helps uh, supplement their requirements there. Florida, on the other side, of, on the southern border, um, they get a lot of money from tourism. Uh, the, the So I don't think that we could do a zero state income tax, but I think that we ought to start working towards it. Uh, and for years and years, we've heard we're going to look at tax reform this time. Tax reform is one of our, but it seems like we just keep looking at it. Uh, it it's a concern in my mind because at some point you got to push the envelope forward. Uh, Stan Caston, you remember Stan Caston with the Braves in the in the uh, he was quoted in the Atlanta Journal a few weeks ago. It's quote it, it stuck with me. If you're afraid of going too far, you're never going to go far enough. And that it burned in my mind. I go, that's right. We're we're so afraid that we're going to go too far that we're not taking the steps necessary to make serious and and legitimate change to our systems we have in place. And it's not just tax. Um, there's a whole gamut of uh, the state government in itself. The 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 bureaucracy of the state government. Now you're going to say. Now, which one of those jobs are you going to come through and, and eliminate? And I, I can't sit there and tell you right now, but if you're in any organization for an amount of time and it's had growth over a period of time because of changes in, in our society, changes to technology, uh, changes to, to a wide gamut of things, you, you tend to add stuff to it. What you find in those loops is there's a, a lot of redundancy at times. It, it's time that I think that we go back and look at our overall structure within the state government reduce the redundancies while we capture and maintain the efficiencies of the state government. Um, we, it's a house that keeps adding rooms. And after a while, it, you kind of get to the point where you, it's almost more effective to level the house and rebuild to suit the needs of, of today. Uh, one of the, uh, let's go to our particular county here, Paulding. Uh -huh. 
Uh, how do you see attracting uh, businesses to this area? I see attracting businesses um, to the area by staying out of your way. Uh, let you do it. What now? There's there's a um, an approach that uh, I like to talk about, and hey, I'm not a professional politician, you know. So there's uh, if you say, well, I introduced a bill five years ago. I, I don't have that. That that's not my background. What I do have is um, a lot of leadership training. Uh, you know, that's all my career was before this point. And being a leader is not stand up, follow me, you're going to do it my way. Being a leader is stand up, is, is collecting a group of individuals around you that are as passionate about what you're doing as you are, that are intelligent enough that they can help you discern what the right course is. And that's not people just agree with you. you got to get people who don't agree with you as well so that um, you don't get jaded or, or, or blinded. You don't put, uh, you don't look at this thing like you're looking down a stovepipe. You know, you're, you're getting a full vision. Now, the, the leadership that, that I'm talking about is taken uh, from this position, working with the uh, state representatives in, in the legislature, the county commissioners, the mayors, the council, the chamber, uh, presidents, the uh, um, businesses across um, the, across all three counties within the district, and saying, "Here is the area that we would like to target, or here are the areas we would like to target. Here is a consolidated approach on how we're going to uh, attract new business coming into to the area." Now, Pawling is a is a, a vital part of the 30th district, so you know that's that's kind of promoting the business into your areas as well. Um, into your specific county, um, but by by having a, a focused, consolidated approach, rather than Mayor A doing his his own sales campaign, Mayor B, uh, you know, you're, you're you're working together towards you know, um, through our district. We have the uh, fiber optic hub that runs the entire eastern seaboard. In my mind, that's almost the equivalent of we're living on the edge of the Mississippi River. Now, a lot of people want to build a port, but if you're not near a body of water, unless it's an airport, it's not going to work. So we have some advantages there that, and, and in addition to that, we got a lot of great um, uh, technology-based companies already in the area. And then go back to what I talked about with um, well, not only the University of West Georgia, which is uh, a, a great and growing institution, but if, if you draw a circle 70 miles around District 30, how many universities do you have in there with, with computer-based programs? And then, like I was talking about with West Georgia Technical College a little while ago, you've got all these uh, potential technicians that they can put in the field. So you've got the, the natural asset, the, not natural, but you know, an asset that's already there. You've got a ready and willing, and like I talked about before, educated workforce. You've got a an, an abundance of uh, future growth potential. You got relatively inexpensive land. Uh, what I'm trying to figure out is how are people not beating down the doors to come here? Why are they not looking at us now? If I could take a guess, okay, and it's, uh, uh, you can't get here. I mean, we have this beautiful airport up, up, up that's been built up the road mm -hmm. here, and but uh, we have a, uh, uh, you, you're not going to attract a, uh, a, a, a uh, one of the freight carriers right. or anything like right. that because our, our people right. that own corporate jets because our road network here, we, we, we've somehow or another over the years didn't, uh, we didn't develop a road network to bring you here quickly. Right. My understanding was y'all made a conscious decision here. Um, you, um, and I'm learning, I, I'm not going to lie to you, I'm learning more and more about Paulding all the time. You know, as a kid growing up in Bowden, Dallas, Georgia, might as well have been Dallas, Texas. Um, because it, it's, a, you, you get on those two lane roads that went from, from Bowden to, to Dallas, yeah. it, it would have taken you, it seemed like, all day. Now, it probably wasn't. It, it, it was probably a pretty quick trip, but if you're a kid in the backseat of the car, it seemed like a long time. But my understanding is, is Paulding made a conscious decision a few years ago that they were going to be more residentially based and less industrial based. Yes. Um, now, if that's the, the, the wishes 
of the people of Paulding, then I respect the wishes. Mm-hmm. If uh, if not, then if if you want to if you want to create a trucking warehouse that semis can do, kind of like uh, for example, the Saddle Creek uh, Corporation is one that I know of in, in Villarica, uh, may not be suited for y'all's area. That's what I'm talking about. When you get the the a consolidated group approach, um, the the representatives from the and what I'm saying representatives, those that are speaking on behalf of the group for the Paulding area, y'all come and say, this is the type organization that that we think would best serve the needs of Paulding, and that we can legitimately get here. Um, yeah, you know, building uh, fishing boats. Probably not going to work in Paulding. No, not likely to. No, I'm talking about the big shrimp yeah. shrimp boats. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, yeah, bass fishing boats may work though. Yeah, bass boats. So uh, yeah, those. So uh, we built a few bass boats in Georgia. We have yeah. several marine well, small. Yeah. Not, I shouldn't say small. Some are pretty large. Build, yeah. Building small boats that you, you know you can truck all over. Yeah, and that's that's the idea. Mm-hmm. Find what works. You know, uh, and when I was growing up in Bowden, uh, textiles were huge. Um, there, there was uh, a lot of generational workers that, um, you know, the, their grandmother was in the mill. They were, in, their parents were in the mill. They were, they were in the mill after they graduated from high school, and they they based their entire livelihood off off textiles. And then it seems like that whole segment of manufacturing went overseas um, because it it became more cost effective to send all the raw. Put them on a ship or plane or however you're going to get them there. But even with the gas, the the time, and time's money, uh, all the the cost to ship them overseas, make them, do all that shipping back, and sell them was cheaper than what we could do it for here. Uh, you know, I'm not sure exactly where we went wrong there. At uh, at 17, 18 years old, uh, all I saw was they were they were going away, um, and then. Um, but I guess where I'm going with that is we sat and waited for them to come back. And I don't think they are anytime soon. It's time to change our focus, move to an area that, that we can support now. Well, like, the, let's, take our, uh, uh, let's take our home re- repossessions. And uh-huh. there's, I guess I may, I'm upside down in my home. doesn't <laughs> concern me because I plan to live there my yeah. whole life. But... Uh, I mean, it looks like I was listening to one of the newscasters on the national scene the other day that was talking about the fact that it, we, it may be 10 or, or, or 15 years before home prices improve. Uh, um, I hope or so. they may uh, never improve. Uh, uh, the, the, they're improving already. So I, I know that they, they're not improving at the rate that you probably you and I would like for them to. Mm-hmm. But, the, uh, uh, but we're seeing some minor, minor positive signs, which... Uh, uh, I hope, as a result of the uh, the election, not my election, but the uh, the presidential election in November, we we see even in greater signs of recovery. But if if the question comes down to, is it going to be what it was six seven years ago? No, no, that was that was artificial. Uh, I, w- I want fifteen twenty years ago. Where you saw sustained, legitimate growth in in the value of your home, uh, I, I can remember my dad when I was a kid say, "Buy land; it never depreciates." Um, and uh, you know, I took that as gospel forever. Uh, it's the first thing I remember him being wrong on. I and my wife and I inherited well, it was actually her mother's side of the family I inherited a farm down in West Point, Georgia. Uh, Boy, I wish you'd have given it to the church or something. That's been the most. Yeah. Uh, you know, the, the day that you could make money off of yeah. land, I mean, you know, yeah. was a good deal. But today, it's, it's just, to us, it's been just uh, property taxes and yeah. this problem. It's, it's been a very expensive yeah. undertaking. Yeah. And I don't see an end to it. And, uh, yeah. and, uh, the, the state, while the, while the federal government does a lot of responsibility for regulating banks, mm-hmm. it's also a state issue. Mm-hmm. And as you, as you know, it's uh, uh, 
It's almost impossible to get a loan out of a bank nowadays mm-hmm. if you're a small businessman. Unless you don't need the money. Unless you don't need the money. Yeah, yeah I mean, yeah, you, pay, you said it right. <laughs> well, Mr. Suit, if you can do this, this, and this, yeah. and this, you know, uh, uh, we'll be happy to loan you money. Uh, but um, no. I'm, I'm sure that... Uh, I'm aware of several small businesses in this area. Right. Uh, particularly a friend of mine has an electrical business. Mm-hmm. A good-sized business. Right. But... You know, nowadays you get in bed with uh, these big corporations that mm-hmm. want to pay you 90 days mm-hmm. out or maybe 120 days out. Mm-hmm. And you're sitting there with 25 employees that you have to pay every week. Right. And you go to the bank and try to get something worked out. And the bank says, no. Yeah, yeah the cash flow problem uh, I know is significant uh, for uh, most every business that has uh, any employees at all. Mm-hmm. You know, you, you're... Your expenses, your ability to pay for um, not just your employees' salaries, but the you know the healthcare benefits that go along with it, the routine maintenance of your, of your facilities. You you can't let the walls fall down around you. Uh, that never stops. It's uh, while you're sleeping at night, some of those issues are still going on, whether whether you want them or not. Uh, but um, I guess kind of where I was going with that is, and I, and I've seen the 90-day payment. It drives me crazy. Um, now, if I turn that around the other way, and I told my uh, a, a credit card company, yeah, I charge it. I take within 90 days, um, I, I'll pay it back. And by the way, it's not going to be uh, over that three month period. It's not going to be at the beginning of the month. It's going to be at the end of the month. You figure out how to. It, it's your debt. Pay your debt. Uh, and I guess part of that is, uh, you know, I talk about personal responsibility. Uh, all that stuff's in the contract on the front side. Um, uh, I guess part of the way is to say, no, nah, I'm, I'm not doing it. We're limited with, with our ability to do that, but as much as possible. Well, I live in a subdivision with probably uh, 80 homes. I think we got 80 homes in it. Mm-hmm. It's supposed to be more, but they quit building when the mm-hmm. recession hit, you know. But uh, uh, at, one, uh, at one time, I would say that of those 80 homes, uh, both spouses were working yeah today i would say out of our 80 homes maybe half of them only have one spouse working right. and that's taking a significant hit on right them. right on the, and i um if you would like i don't know if you want to get onto the national scene just for your own comments but it looks like to me we're going to have to have some changes to get something done I but i can't tell you what change yeah it, it's one of those that uh, you know if you 10 years ago the biggest dilemma that we were facing was both parents were working. We had latchkey kids, um, and uh, part of the gener- the the issue that we were having with millennials is they didn't have the stay-at-home parents. Um, um, now I wish that we had a uh, we we had both parents back at work because it's a uh, you based you based a whole lot of life decisions off of uh, anticipated income and then all of a sudden from no fault of your own it's gone uh, and it, it's it's just terrible and we just got to work it get it better well before we close here sir was there any particular thing you'd like to say or uh, we'll open the we'll open <laughs> it to you <laughs> I, I'm, I'm pretty succinct uh, pretty concise with with my comments I, I'm not gonna not gonna spend a whole lot of time on it I, I will say thank you for for having me in I, I appreciate coming up. This is uh, sitting and getting interviewed on, at any time is is not well within my comfort zone, but I, I appreciate it having the opportunity and uh, and I look forward to working with y'all again. I hope I, that I, I can get uh, the support of the voters of, of the polling portion of the 30th district and uh, well, we would like service your senator. It was it was a pleasure meeting you. Well, thanks, sir. And I do want to thank you for your service. Thank you, sir. As uh, I think everybody in the county will. Um, We're a patriotic bunch here. Yeah, uh, well, you know, us southern crowds kind of got to, <laughs> I won't go there, but it's got up. But anyway, it was a pleasure. Thanks, sir. Thank you. I appreciate it. This has been Interviews to Suit, the Peacock TV production.